Alex Cardinelli, where I break down crimes that shocked America. Today, I am going to talk about a crime that happened in the state that I live currently. This crime happened in June of 1990, and it was committed by a depressed spree killer a madman, a liar, and a con. Today, I'm going to talk about the depressed spree killer, James Poe, here on On the Case with Detective Alex Cardinelli. Now, James Poe was in trouble with the law for a huge majority of his life whether it's for stealing or um, minor crimes or even a murder in the 70s, James Poe was, no, was known to detectives and police in the Jacksonville area for quite a long time. Now, when James Poe's mother died, he went into a depressed state and he lost all sense of reality, and he lost sense of what was right and wrong, and he committed a horrific act on June 18, 1990, when he went to the GMAC office in Jacksonville, Florida, and shot nine people, killing four, or excuse me, shot 13 people, killing nine and injuring four. This is a very, very horrific case that I'm going to talk about. And I believe it's the first case of where I live that I am talking about. This case is from Jacksonville, Florida. And this case actually shook America for quite some time because it was the first mass murder conducted by a black American, by an African American male, and it caused quite a lot of controversy. There was a lot of newspaper articles about an African American male committing a mass shooting. And to this date, I think he is the only African American male to have done a mass shooting, and hopefully it will stay that way. So today I'm going to break down James Poe. I'm going to talk about all the crimes he committed before this horrible act and what led him to committing this horrible act. There's a lot of conspiracies out there. Some people theorize that um, the loss of his mother, his financial problems, it led to him snapping and it caused him to kill nine people and injure four others. We're going to find that out right here, right now, 
on On the Case with Alex Cardinelli. And this episode is kickstarting the biggest week of 2022 here on my YouTube channel, the legendary Alex Cardinelli, because this week we celebrate my eighth year as a YouTuber. So before we get started, I'd like to remind all our viewers, whether you're watching this video live or you're catching the replay of today's video, please share your thoughts on James Poe and his murders in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts on this crime in the comments. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to start by discussing what to know about James Edward Poe, who is the suspect and the perpetrator of today's crime case. So James Poe was born on February 16th, 1948 in Jacksonville, Florida, and he was the first of nine children. He grew up in an area near Florida Community College at Jacksonville. As a child, James Poe suffered from asthma, and he had a close relationship to his mother, whom he had helped out a lot after his father left the family in 1959. He attended a vocational school, but dropped out in his sophomore year. At the age of 18, he began working as a common laborer, which he remained as until his death. During the last year of his life, he was doing construction maintenance at a brewery. According to formal, former schoolmates, James Poe had affiliations with gangs during his time at school. He was arrested twice in 1965 for vagrancy and twice again in 1966, once for attempted robbery and a second time for assault after he attacked a construction worker who owed him a quarter. Oh my God, imagine that. You're going to beat someone's ass over a quarter. So in 2022, that is almost laughable, but I assume in 1966, a quarter was probably like 10 to $15 uh, back then, and that's how much it probably would be worth today. In 1968, James Poe was arrested for dangerously displaying a knife and was fined $75. And in July 1969, he was fined $10 after being charged for gambling. In 1970, he was arrested but not prosecuted for motor vehicle theft and vagrancy prowling by auto. So even before he's in his 30s, he's already known by the police and the detectives and he's already got several arrests under his name and in his record. So this guy was a common crook before he even hit the age of 30. That is awful. Um, and I'm lucky that I am not like James Poe in the slightest. I have nothing on my record, which I'm really, really proud about. But I digress. This show is not about me because I am certainly no criminal. Several years prior to his shooting spree, on May 8th, 1971, James Poe got into an argument with his best friend, David Lee Pender, who had called his girlfriend a bitch. So James's best friend, David Pender, called his girlfriend a bitch. And you want to know what James's response was? Well, in the following scuffle, James grabbed a 38 caliber revolver from his girlfriend's purse and shot Pender three times, who eventually died in a hospital bed. So if James is willing to shoot his best friend 
for simply calling his girlfriend a bitch. Imagine what James would do to someone he does not care about or know. This is going to set the scene for later on in the show when we talk about James Poe's massacre in Jacksonville, Florida. James Poe had no regard for humans. He only cared about himself. He was a selfish black man who did not care about anyone, including his best friend, because if he cared for his best friend, instead of shooting him, he would have just simply said, hey, bro, that's my girlfriend. Don't talk about her like that. But instead, he did the most stupidest thing on earth. He grabbed the gun and shot his best friend. And there's no way in hell that I would shoot someone that I consider to be a brother and a best friend simply because they called my significant loved one uh, a bastard or a bitch. I wouldn't shoot them. I would just say, hey, don't talk to that person like that. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't take their life because they called my loved one a bitch. But according to relatives, he never managed to get over the fact that he had killed his best friend friend. As a matter of fact, in the years that followed, it really haunted James Poe. James Poe was initially charged with murder, though on his behalf and through luck, the charge was later reduced to manslaughter. In the end, he pleaded guilty to aggravated assault and was sentenced to five years probation. But the judgment of his guilt was withheld by the court subject to the successful completion of probation. Due to James Poe's violent behavior in the past, it was also ruled that he should never be allowed to own a gun, though this was never forwarded to police. A very big mistake. And that is the reason we're talking about the crime that we're talking about today. I guarantee you this would not happen in today's day and age. Our government system and our law and order system is much better today than it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and hell, even 90s. As a result of his ruling not being forwarded to the police, James Poe was not considered a felon and therefore, he was able to purchase several handguns, among them the ROHM RG31 38 caliber revolver he later used to commit suicide, which was registered with the police on June 4th, 1979. In 1977, James Poe appeared twice in court for charges of bad debt, and there was also an outstanding warrant for his arrest in a 1982 employment compensation fraud case. That is the reason why I call James Poe a con man. He's not only a murderer, he's not only a very bad person, but he's a con man. He lied and scammed to get money from the government. Anyway, life prior to the shootings. In December of 1988, James Poe traded his old car for a 1988 Pontiac Grand Am, though he soon had difficulties to make his payments. As a result, the car was vol voluntarily repossessed by GMAC in January of 1990, he received a bill for $6,394. Now, as of 2021, that would have been around $13,200 of outstanding fees in March of 1990. And again, on April 6, 1990, which was the last contact between him and the office. About two months prior to the shootings, James Poe purchased a universal brand M1 carbine 
at a local pawn shop. James Poe, who was living in a rundown duplex in Jacksonville's Northwest Quadrant at the time, was known by his neighbors as a quiet and nice man who kept a regular and fixed schedule, but also as someone who would become angry fairly quickly and get engaged in erase in erase conversations, especially in matters concerning money and his car. But you know what? I can sympathize with him there. I too will get enraged when someone talks about my financial situation. So if someone is questioning me about what I spend my money on or how much money I have left, I you bet your ass, I'm going to get pretty angry at it. But I probably wouldn't kill you unless I had to. Unless you had money that I can take, then I probably would kill you. <laughs> just, just kidding. I'm a detective. I can't say that. Anyway, relatives describe James Poe as a recluse with no friends. So before the actual shootings in June of 1990, James Poe, uh, was going through some financial problems. So let's think about it before we get to the actual crime. His beloved car, which I believe was a sports car, it was a more uh, fancy car. So that gets repoed. Then he starts getting the bills for that car that is in no longer his possession. So I imagine he's thinking to himself, why should I pay for this car if you repoed it? And then he's got people questioning him about his financial business. So I can understand how angry he is and how depressed he is. The next event that happened could have been the final straw. It could have been the straw that broke the camel's back. And it could have been what led him to commit this horrible act. After the death of his murder, three years prior to the shootings, James Poe was said to have emotionally changed for the worst, saying that he had nothing left to live for and arguing that he would take someone with him when he leaves this world. Frequently, he had violent outbursts, which were directed against his wife, Teresa, and twice he threatened her by putting a gun to her head. In January 1990, they separated as Miss Poe feared for her safety. And on March 2nd, she was granted an injunction that disallowed Poe to get in contact with her for a year. As a consequence, he withdrew even more and rarely socialized. So we're going to add all the components together, and this is, to, this is going to be what leads us to the mass shooting that James Poe did. His car gets repossessed in 1988, and in 1989 and 1990, he's getting the bills for the car that he no longer has. He's got people questioning him about his financial standings and what he's doing with his money. He lost his mother three years prior to what I'm going to talk about next, the shootings. And he changed emotionally for the worst. And he was very violent and angry. And finally, the straw that broke the camel's back, his wife leaving him and eventually probably would have gone for a divorce as well. So that's all the information you need to know about James Poe. Now, let's talk about the massive shooting that James Poe did on June 18th, 1990. So, the shooting spree. James Poe started his killing spree in the night of June 17th at about 12.50 a.m. He was armed with a blanket-wrapped M1 carbon. And not far from his home, he
he walked up to a group of men standing at a street corner in the northwest section of Jacksonville, and he killed a gentleman by the name of Lewis Carl Bacon with two shots in the chest before fleeing. A couple of minutes later, he attacked Doretta Drake, who was chatting with two other women in a vacant parking lot just two blocks from the first crime scene. After hitting Drake with his car, throwing her on the sidewalk, James stepped out of his Buick and killed her with a single shot to the head before driving away. A short time later, James also shot and wounded two youths who were ages 17 and 18 after asking them for directions. Later on in the morning of July 18th, which is the night of the massacre, James Poe entered a convenience store, threatened the clerk with a pistol, and stating that he didn't have anything to lose, demanded all of the money in the register. After getting the money, he left. After robbing the convenience store, he visited his mother's gravesite one last time and then called his supervisor to state that he wouldn't be coming to work today because he had something else to do. And that morning at about 10.44 a.m., James Powell parked his car at the General Mortars Ascentance Corporation office located at 7870 Bay Meadows Way in Jacksonville. He entered the building through the front door, armed with his M1 carbine, a ROHMRG 3138 caliber revolver, several loaded magazines, and ammunition packed in his pockets. Without saying a word, he immediately began shooting with the M1 carbine at two customers at the front counter killing a lady by the name of Julia Burgess and wounding David Hendricks with four shots. Walking through the open office, he then systematically moved from desk to desk and shot at the GMAC workers, deliberately aiming at those hiding under their desk. Drew Woods was the first to be shot in his desk followed by Cynthia Perry and Barbara Holland nearby, as well as Phyllis Griggs, who was injured. When the GMAC employees realized what was going on, many of them escaped through a back door of the building while Poe started shooting at those ducking for cover. JMAC employees Janice David, Sharon Hall, Joel Bilot, Lee Simonton, Denise Heifel, Ron, and Nancy Dill were also shot. It was then that he put the 38 caliber revolver to his head and committed suicide. In just under two minutes, James Poe had fired at the least 28 rounds from his carbine hitting 11 of the 85 workers in the office, as well as the two customers. Six of his victims died at the scene, while another three died at the hospital. The last being Joelle Ballot, who succumbed to her wounds nine days after the shooting. When searching James Poe's car, police recovered a loaded 9mm semi-automatic machine pistol, two magazines and ammunition, as well as 12 pieces of nylon rope, each having a length of 24 inches, which led police to the assumption that James initially might have intended to take hostages. When police arrived at James Poe's home, it had been ransacked. They found the calendar with two dates circled in red. May 8th, 
the day he killed his friend Pender, and June 18th, which ultimately became the day that he pulled this massive mass shooting out where he shot and killed nine people and injured four more. A very horrific crime. Shout out to my friend Jeffrey Edward, who was tuning in live. Hey, Jeff, how are you? It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of today's video. And that goes for everyone that is watching today's video live. I really appreciate your view. And even if you're watching this video in the archive, I appreciate your view as well. So there you have it. June 18th, 1990, James Poe kills nine at the GMAC office in Jacksonville, Florida, and injures four. On top of that, on June 17th, 1990, he killed a gentleman and a lady, and in 1980s, he killed his best friend, Ponder. So he is a killing machine. He killed a lot of people, sadly. And he also killed himself, thank God, because I would not want this piece of shit in jail. Um, he needed to kill himself, and he did. He really had nothing else to live for. So my thoughts on this case. This could have been prevented had the government and the law system stepped in and had him put in jail for the murder of his best friend in the late 80s, I believe it was. Because of that big glitch in the system, James Poe got a second chance of life. And what did he do with it? He absolutely wasted it. He killed nine innocent people at a car dealership, all because of his depression and all the stuff he had going on. You know, I can sympathize with him for the fact that he was going through a divorce. He lost his mother a couple of years prior to this mass shooting. Um, he killed his best friend. I can sympathize with him with there. But even if you're depressed, you don't go out and kill and injure other people because you're having a hard time. I cannot condone that. Um, it's just an awful situation. And like I said, had the government, government and the law system not made that mistake in the 80s when he killed his friend, if they prosecuted him for murder and threw his ass in jail, I guarantee you he would not have been able to kill nine people and injure others and change their lives for the worse because of his actions. And he would not have been able to threaten his wife and all this horrible stuff that happened. So it just goes to show you how much better our legal system is in 2022 compared to the 80s and 90s, where mistakes like this cost people their lives eventually. Now, I'm not saying that all future uh, I'm not saying that everyone else that had glitches in their cases um, become mass shooters. I'm just saying that this is a good example of what could happen if the law system does not work the way it's supposed to. So that's my thoughts on this case, a very horrific and sad crime case that should have never happened. And as I said earlier on in the introduction of today's show, I believe James Poe is the only black African-American male to commit a mass shooting. So we'll have to see how long that stands for. You never know. There's, there seems to be a mass shooting every day of people with all races are committing uh, mass shootings. So the last thing I'll say about the James Poe mass shooting in Jacksonville, Florida, is that this is like the second deadliest mass shooting in Florida. It was upstaged by the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016, 
when that one was committed. A lot more people suffered and a lot more people were killed by a terrorist who had problems with gay people. But we'll talk about that case on a future episode of On the Case with Detective Alex Cardinelli. All right. I hope you enjoy this case. I hope you enjoy this crime case with me, Detective Alex Cardinelli. Next week on the next episode of On the Case with Detective Alex Cardinelli, we're going to talk about a deranged mass shooter, a complete psycho of a mass shooter. This guy thought he was the Joker from Batman. Next week, I'm talking about James Holmes, who committed the Aurora movie theater shootings. And that took place 10 years ago in July. So next Monday, March 7th, 2022, at 11 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, find out about James Holmes and the Aurora movie theater shooting. 11 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, right here on On the Case with Detective Alex Cardinelli and my YouTube channel, The Legendary Alex Cardinelli. My co-host and our crime analyst, Michael Petty, should be back next week. So hopefully Michael Petty will be back next week to help us break down the James Holm case. And he can offer his thoughts on that case, as well as um, discuss another crime topic that is very important when it comes to these mass shootings, and that is how to stay safe in them. So until then, I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you guys stay safe out there because it's a crazy world out there. And I hope you get ready for our next episode of On the Case with Alice Cardinelli next week, where I'll discuss James Holmes. This Saturday or this Sunday here on my YouTube channel, I'm going to celebrate my eight year YouTube anniversary. And I, Detective Alex Cardinelli, will be making an appearance on the eight year YouTube anniversary. And I'll have the topic of if crimes were legal. What crimes would I discuss? It's the one night of my life where I can break crimes and, and I can break the law and do crimes. Well, I'll do it this, this Sunday. So join me this Sunday for my eight-year YouTube anniversary, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Make sure you guys subscribe to my YouTube channel to watch all of my previous crime episodes. Just go to my um, crime playlist, which would be the On the Case with Alice Cardinelli playlist on my YouTube channel and check out all of my previous crime episodes. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Legendary Alice Cardinelli, for all my crime videos and more. I'll see you next Monday. Stay safe, everybody. Legendary Alex Cardinelli here to tell you that the biggest party of the year is going to have a pre-show. Alex Cardinelli's legendary eight-year YouTube anniversary weekend kicks off this Saturday, March 5th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific with the eight-year YouTube anniversary pre-show. Just one night before the big event, find out everything you need to know about the biggest party of the year. Plus, two of my legendary subscribers will be immortalized forever. To kick off the pre-show, 
the eight subscribers who will be entered into the eight-year YouTube anniversary giveaway will be announced on the eight-year YouTube anniversary pre-show. Any last-minute news for the biggest show, live stream, and party of the year will be announced on the pre-show. One of the topics for the eight-year YouTube anniversary pre-show will be eight reasons to subscribe to my YouTube channel, the legendary Alex Cardinelli. There will be eight clips from previous YouTube videos on my YouTube channel. These clips can be funny, informal, or just some of my favorite videos as we celebrate eight strong years as a YouTuber. And it's going to be an awesome time to look back at some of my biggest clips on my YouTube channel. I'm also going to air some never before seen clips that never made it to my YouTube channel on my eight year YouTube anniversary free show. And the main event for the inaugural YouTube anniversary free show, I present to everybody the legendary Alex Cardinelli Subscriber Hall of Fame. Every year, two of my legendary subscribers will be inducted into the Hall of Fame. These subscribers will be recognized for their loyalty and their patronage to my YouTube channel. This year's inductees, inductee number one, my dear friend Matt Thibodeau from Springfield, Massachusetts, will be our very first inductee. He is the reason why I am still on YouTube today. And inductee number two is one of the people that I first met when I started my YouTube channel. He is known as William T. Hannaford, aka Hannah Pro Discus. So Matt and William will be the very first two inductees inducted into the legendary Alex Cardinelli Subscriber Hall of Fame. And that takes place live this Saturday, March 5th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, only on my YouTube channel, the legendary Alex Cardinelli. One night before our big party, join the pre-show and have some fun. Legendary Alex Cardinelli, here to tell you that history is awaiting, and history will be conquered this Sunday. Live this Sunday, March 6, 2022, at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, on my YouTube channel, The Legendary Alex Cardinelli. I would proudly celebrate my eighth year as a YouTuber with the inaugural YouTube anniversary celebration. It's going to be a night of non-stop action and a night you are going to love. You are listening to the official theme song for this year's anniversary. And the official theme song is The Legendary by Pop Evil. So make sure you're legendary for the 8th year YouTube anniversary this Sunday. 
kicking off this year's show, I'll announce the winners of the legendary subscriber giveaway. Which two of my 16,000 subscribers will walk away with the $80 gift card to Texas Roadhouse? I am very proud to announce that for the first time in my YouTube history, I am going to have a legend in the house. There is going to be an appearance by WWE Hall of Famer and hardcore legend Mick Foley. Which face of Foley will appear? Will it be all three faces of Foley? You gotta tune in to find out. Bang bang! Bang bang! The first confirmed special guest is going to be a fish keeping friend of mine. He is from Western Massachusetts and he has an aquarium maintenance company called Blue View Aquatics and he's also known as the Diver Man, Josh Rodriguez. Find out what the Diver Man is all about and how he's helping the ocean by removing plastic. Josh is going to be the first guest interview to start the eight-year YouTube anniversary. My next guest is also a friend of mine, and he's also a tropical fish keeper. He's right here in southern Florida in Miami, to be exact. Special guest tropical fish keeper Jacob Ratner will be on the show. Jacob is growing out my red tail cat that he got for me last summer. And he's also got a couple of other fish from me. He's going to tell us how those fish are doing and a whole lot more this Sunday on my eight-year YouTube anniversary. Will there be surprise special guests? Hmm. You got to tune in to find out. There will be appearances from... Aqua Alex Cardinelli, who will discuss the tropical fish species he's kept over the last eight years. And as a surprise, he will show off getting his new 125-gallon aquarium. There will also be an appearance by Chef Alex Cardinelli, who is going to make a Twix cheesecake and a Reese's cake. There will be an appearance by WWE fanboy Alex Cardinelli, who will share his dream WrestleMania 38 card. And finally, there will be an appearance by Detective Alex Cardinelli, who will discuss what he would do if crime was legal. And he'll also discuss a crime that shocked America. It all goes down live this Sunday March 6, 2022, on the 8-year YouTube anniversary. There's also going to be plenty of surprises. What are the surprises going to be? One of the surprises is going to be an appearance by Brandy Cardinelli, who hasn't been on my YouTube channel in many years, but she'll make her appearance on the 8-year YouTube anniversary. If you don't know who Brandy is, tune in to the 8-year YouTube anniversary. The 8-year YouTube anniversary goes down live this Sunday, March 6, 2022 at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on my YouTube channel, The Legendary Alex Cardinelli. Be legendary and tune in to the 8-year YouTube anniversary this Sunday, March 6th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 